Thank you uh, for being here tonight and working through that little technical glitch. Um, it seems like a lot of you are on our website right now, and so you may need to uh, refresh to make sure that the video is working. Um, so a couple of uh, things before we get started today. Um, the first is that we have uh, a brand new book list up on the Event Camp website. So it's uh, the Educator Collaborative Makerspace Camp book list. A big shout out to Joellen McCarthy um, and our friends at BookSource who helped to put this together. Um, we've organized it into a whole bunch of different categories so you can uh, find some books for your classroom, um, like the Makerspace Growth Mindset, um, makerspace advocacy, makerspace creativity, makerspace invention, scientists in the field. I mean, it's, it is so huge and so awesome. Um, so feel free to go to uh, event.theeducatorcollaborative.com. Um, that's our event page. Many of you are watching the keynote right now, and you can see um, the book lists are there underneath the camp stuff link. Um, also underneath the camp stuff link uh, is a link to some of the work that Troy will be sharing with you during the keynote and lots of other great things there too. So big hooray um, for suggestions for awesome books for our classroom. Um, so now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce you or reintroduce you to uh, Laura Fleming who will introduce you to our keynote speaker this afternoon, Troy Hicks. Um, welcome Laura. Hi again, everybody. It is such an honor to be here again with you tonight, and I would like to present to you all one of my rock star educators, Mr. Troy Hicks. Troy is an associate professor and director of Central Michigan University's National Writing Project site, and the author of some fantastic books, such as Crafting Digital Writing and The Digital Writing Workshop, one of my personal favorites. Troy has been an idol and inspiration of mine for a very long time, and I know what he will say tonight will inspire and excite the maker in all of us. So rookies, cadets, and admirals, I present to you Mr. Troy Hicks. Thanks so much, Laura and Chris. I feel like I should say ahoy or something to that effect, but uh, welcome and thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. And I just, I also want to say I really appreciate the opportunity um, that you provided in terms of helping me push my thinking and thinking about uh, what it means to make and to write and to connect. And so without further ado, I'm going to jump into my slide deck and um, I'll periodically pop back in here. And I think Chris and Laura are going to monitor the Twitter chat, which I have open in a side window here. So I'll try to address questions as I see them. But uh, let's go ahead and just uh, jump right in. There's so much to talk about and I'd really like to just get started. So the general idea tonight is that we are talking about uh, this notion of making and writing and repeating. I want to be thinking about how it is that we can have our students engage in this uh, process of um, this constant uh, thought and creative revision. So what is it that we're asking students to do in the writing process and what are we asking them to do in the making process. And so with that in mind, I have three kind of big things I'd like to talk through tonight. I'd like to introduce you to some big ideas and then to some really thoughtful teachers and then some opportunities to use some digital writing tools. So let's begin. We're going to start by thinking about some uh, digital um, making, connecting, writing process ideas. They're all over the place, but I've tried to gather them here and introduce you to some of the people that I think are, are moving us in the right direction in terms of thinking about how the maker movement and the literacy connections are really powerful. So first of all, I, I just had to go and start thinking about, you know, what is making? And, you know, I'd heard the term uh, before this issue of Wired. Uh, this is one of my geeky side uh, reading pleasures is Wired Magazine, but when this issue came out about two years ago, it was really interesting to me because I had gone with my family to uh, Maker Faire in uh, uh, the Henry Ford in Dearborn, and I was 
still, I, I understood the DIY and the, and the many of the things that Laura talked about last night and many of the wonderful things that we got in our, our Makerspace kits. And this idea that, you know, it's based on DIY and this focus on using and learning and transferring practical skills and, and you know, turning them into new designs. And my wife has started a club with our kids, an after-school computer club, and was using DIY.org. And, and so I understood making from the real hands-on perspective, but I was I was struggling a little bit and trying to think about what it means to think about making from a writing perspective. And you know, one of the the good uh, fortunes and opportunities that I've had is to think uh, with Elise Eidman Adal, who's our current uh, executive director of the National Writing Project. And she and I, uh, along with another colleague, Danielle DeVos, were able to collaborate on a book called Because Did digital writing matters. And in this book, we, you know, answered that question, of course, why does digital writing matter? But we also were trying to push the boundaries and, and help our K-12 colleagues, as well as some other university faculty, embrace this wider view of writing. And this particular quote comes from a video that Elise did for Edutopia, but she says, when we actually see our writing published, we probably have to engage with the fact that we are really writers. And she broadens this definition of writing uh, to include videos that go on YouTube or a website that gets published or a blog or a wiki or, or any other type of feature such as that. And I think the factor is, um, that our writing can be exponential, it can circulate, it can go into a variety of places. And I've been really fortunate, and Laura was very gracious in her introduction, and Chris has been very gracious in providing a, a, an overview and introduction to um, a forward of crafting digital writing. Lots of people have embraced this idea about digital writing, and, and now I'm trying tonight to see if we can tie it together with making. So. One of the other things that I think, and this is why I put the repeat in the title, is that um, as with any writing process or any making process, um, the product is not the end. Um, you know, we of course have the the uh, mantra from Lucy Calkins: "When you're done, you've just begun." And and we can think about that from a making and a digital writing perspective as well. And one of the new lenses that I think is really important, and I, I would encourage all of you to check out, is this concept of connected learning. Mimi Ito, Chris Gutierrez, and a number of their colleagues have been putting together um, a theory, a model, a framework of connected learning. And they say that connected learning draws on the power of today's technology to fuse young people's interests, friendships, and academic achievements through experiences laced with hands-on production, shared purpose, and open networks. And so we have this opportunity to really think about you know, how are we adapting um, these new models of learning, which in some ways are not that new. In fact, you know, we've, we've known that apprenticing has been a good model of learning for a long time. Um, but what happens now when we have these open networks and, and new opportunities? And so a couple other people that I think are really important to this, and I won't spend quite as much time on these. You can link to the resources and, and think about what they have to say. But uh, Mark Hatch is one of the kind of the founders of the maker movement, and he has this book, and you can read the first part of of it online, the Maker Movement Manifesto. One of his ideas from that manifesto is that be playful. Uh, be playful with what you're making and you will be surprised, excited, and proud of what you discover. And I know, I know, I know that our, our schools um, are just in that constant state of worry and concern over the standardized testing. Believe me, my own children are going through it in Michigan right now and I cannot say how many days are devoted to the standardized testing because quite simply I, I can't count them all. So I know the pressures that you're all under but we have to provide students with opportunities to play and we'll talk about some some tools that you can do that tonight. Just giving them the opportunity to play try something out, fail, before they turn it into something that's a more formalized project. Another big thinker is Mitch Resnick from um, the MIT Media Lab, and he heads the, the, the part of the lab that's called Lifelong Kindergarten. He's responsible for Lego Mindstorms. And I picked this particular quote from his, his uh, essay on Lifelong Kindergarten because he talks about how digital technologies don't support any 
you know, particular approach to learning, which I think is very in line with what I've advocated for for a long time with digital writing. And what I really appreciate in his quote here is that if it's designed and supported, we can extend this kindergarten approach so that all learners can continue to learn in this style. And that's what I hope you take away from our conversation tonight, that again, we're structuring, we're scaffolding, we're mentoring, we're thinking about how we can get our students to be thoughtful, critical, and creative digital writers and infuse some of that maker ethos into this as well. Last but not least, I want to introduce you to two ideas, two big thinkers that I really appreciate. Uh, one I've had the opportunity to collaborate with and one I uh, hopefully is on my bucket list to see live uh, in a presentation someday, but he's got TED Talks all over the place, um, is uh, Larry Lessig and then Renee Hobbs. So Larry Lessig uh, talks about this idea of a remix culture and thinking about what it means in terms of copyright and fair use and he's also one of the people behind Creative Commons. We need to be teaching our students really critical thoughtful digital literacy skills and, and this idea of the remix um, is a very important one. You can read his book for free, download it online, you can also catch his TED talk on remix culture. The other person who's really informed my thinking on all of this is Renee Hobbs and her book Copyright Clarity uh, is a great example of of, um, rethinking what it means to um, use fair use. How is it that we have opportunities and responsibilities and um, you know different ways that we can invite our students to use copyrighted material for educationally useful uh, ways as well as to critique or to parody. Um, so these are two big thinkers. We don't have nearly enough time to talk about all their ideas, but I just want to share them with you for just a, just a moment and give you that uh, opportunity to begin thinking about them. So I wanted to think um, you know, about those big ideas, but I also really want to start thinking about teachers. And uh, I have the good fortune of being able to work with teachers, pre-service teachers and in-service teachers. I get to work with them through workshops and professional development. I get to visit their classrooms. I have lots of different ways that I get to collaborate with them. So I'm going to introduce to you a number of teachers that I've, I've had the good fortune to talk with and collaborate with over the past couple of years. Um, of course, I'm going to leave off more names than I could include in this presentation. So I apologize to all my colleagues who uh, I, I don't mention here, but I do want to um, think broadly about what can we do from our youngest learners all the way up to um, you know high school and beyond? What can we do to infuse this maker ethos into opportunities for digital writing? So let me introduce you to some of my colleagues that I collaborate with. All right, I'll turn that back on. So introducing some teachers. Uh, first person I'd like to introduce you to is Jeremy Heiler. He's a middle school teacher here in Michigan, and he's also the co-director of our writing project. I was able to uh, co-author a book called Create, Compose, Connect with Jeremy. And one of the, the tools that he has, uh, or one of the opportunities that he uses to infuse the maker ethos, is a video book trailer. And Jeremy's written a chapter about this in a book we have coming out soon. But basically, he took the, the formulaic kind of book review model, and he asked his students instead to begin creating video book trailers. And, and he began by using Animoto, and now he's even expanding into some other digital creation tools and thinking about what opportunities they could offer, such as we video. But the idea was that not only did they write the, the more kind of traditional formal book review, but they're also offering a digital book trailer so that they have this opportunity to express themselves visually. So there's one is kind of the both and thinking about how to represent books. Another colleague um, that I have a great deal of respect for and that I'm really, he's on my bucket list, I've got to get to this man's classroom someday, is Kevin Hodgson who teaches in Massachusetts. And one of his latest, um, you know, themes and ideas, is especially related to making and doing, is this idea of having his students create video games. He uses a, a tool called GameStar Mechanic and he talks with his students about this opportunity to craft video games um, in a narrative sense. What is it that we want to tell about our uh, characters, about the conflict, about the setting? 
we're not just making a game for the sake of making a game, but he talks very thoughtfully about how the process of making a game, uh, doing beta tests of a game, getting feedback once you've tried to beta test a game from your users, get that feedback, how it's very much like the writing process. And he just has this unique and wonderful perspective about literacy that he shares with the sixth graders that I think is, uh, again, indicative of the maker movement and certainly something you can check out in terms of digital writing. Another colleague um, from the National Writing Project is Gail Dessler. She works as a technology uh, coordinator and integrator um, in the Elk Grove School District out in California. One of her major um, areas that she is uh, focused on is this idea of digital citizenship. And even beginning as young as kindergarten, working with students to think about what it is that happens when you have a digital footprint. And this little screenshot right here is one of the activities that's part of her digital ID curriculum that she's created with Natalie Berlusconi. Um, and this notion that we can get kids to be critically and carefully thinking about how they work online, how they represent themselves, and how they communicate with others. So they use this voice thread as an opportunity to um, you know, begin these conversations and, and share their ideas with one another. Another colleague from the National Writing Project is Janelle Bentz, who teaches in Texas. And she is um, very closely involved with the KQED Do Now program. Do Now is an initiative that KQED out of San Francisco began to get kids reading and writing and viewing and visually representing and thinking carefully about media discourse and communicating via social media. So Janelle, uh, among dozens of other teachers, have their students communicating using the Do Now hashtag. They get a new prompt every week, and the focus is really about creating effective arguments and engaging in civic discourse. So again, we want to make sure that we're not only inviting our students to produce and publish online and, and make their, their writing available to a global audience, but to actually engage with that global audience. And I think that um, Janelle's work with the Do Now initiative is very indicative of how those conversations can happen. Another colleague who is involved in Do Now, but is also involved in another project um, that we just finished up is Dawn Reed. Uh, she and I were able to work with her ninth grade students on a collaborative inquiry-based unit where we asked students to examine not only the American culture at large, but culture in a piece of literature, as well as culture from their own perspective. What does it mean for me? How do I de identify myself and my, my personal um, culture? So thinking about you know what this perspective is, and this particular image is really interesting because we have two students who are using an iPhone to take a picture of the classroom. This was just one small activity that we did where we asked them to take a picture of the classroom from a perspective other than your desk, and we began to thinking about how photographs are framed, and, and that was one element of visual literacy that we taught in the whole unit. Another way to think about making is to really look carefully at mentor text. And Julie Johnson, who uh, teaches uh, in Hilliard schools near Columbus, Ohio, has her students look at Wonderopolis, which is a really thoughtful, wonderfully intriguing website that puts out a wonder of the day, invites students to engage in that wonder, ask questions, read, take quizzes, share their ideas. But Julie has them go a step further, and when they're doing their research projects, she has her uh, second, third grade students engage in this process of creating their own wonder. Um, what do they wonder about, and then how can they create a website um, in the spirit of Wonderopolis as a digital mentor text? Another opportunity for making and connecting comes from Catherine Hale, who teaches in Alexandria, Virginia. And Catherine asks her students to be thinking about dual forms of literacy. So you can see in this picture here, one of her students is using an iPad, but also using a, a whiteboard. And she has her students 
constantly moving back and forth between different devices, engaging different literacies, thinking about what's going to work best for them. And what I find most interesting is that, you know, Catherine will often introduce them to a number of different tools and will then um, give them the choice and say, whatever works for you, um, or maybe you even have something different that you'd like to try. So she gives uh, her students that choice and invites them to make uh, their own literacy artifacts depending on uh, what it is that they're most interested in and working on at the time. Another teacher that I've had a good fortune of working with, and his classroom's on my bucket list too, as is Catherine's and Julie's. I, I forget about saying all these people that I want to visit still, um, is Jack Zangerly, who um, teaches in New York. Uh, he worked with Bonnie Kaplan, uh, one of the co-directors of the Hudson Valley Writing Project, and uh, created a public service announcement unit, teaching his eighth graders about argument writing, but also teaching them how to make the moves of argument in digital digital text and thinking about what it is that students are um, you know tuned into and conscious of when really thinking about visual culture and the kinds of arguments that appeal to them but also not just relying completely on emotion and thinking about the logic and you know so there's a good combination of ethos pathos and logos to use that rhetoric term but he has his students craft um, public service announcements which I've written about before in my books and again I'm, I'm happy to say that Jack and uh, Bonnie are going to be uh, sharing some of their work with this particular public service announcement um, in a book that we have coming up uh, coming out soon, hopefully later this year. Another couple things that we can think about in terms of making, um, Erin Klein, uh, who teaches here in Michigan, has her students, again, use digital tools in a variety of ways. This particular snapshot is of one of her students, also named Erin, who created an augmented reality um, app or an augmented reality experience using an app called Erasma. And basically what that means is that um, students can take pictures of like book covers or in this case a poster and then they can also record a short video or make a hyperlink to something else. So when a parent or a friend or somebody with the Erasma app comes up to the poster, they scan it and then just like a QR code, boom, it takes them to another place. And so this would happen when someone came up to Aaron's poster, they would you know, use the Erasmus app and then they would get to hear him talking through his description of his project. So again, making can involve multiple literacies and can span different types of media, both print and digital. I think that's really important to consider. And then Christina Puntel, a colleague from Philadelphia, who is also interested in a variety of media. This particular example comes from some of her students that were working on a teach-in project. They were doing a teach-in day, basically a, a conference for students put on by students, for students in the school, uh, which is a maker ethos type of idea in and of itself. And then she allowed students to have this opportunity to create whatever they wanted. And like Kevin Hodgson's students, these two happen to use uh, GameStar Mechanic to create a social justice themed um, video game uh, called the Coco Thief. And um, again, infusing these ideas of uh, video um, de game design and thinking about everything that um, works in terms of helping students think about the argument they're making and how they can incorporate that into the video game itself. I want to introduce you to just two more teachers here. Steph West Puckett is a colleague from uh, East Carolina University. She's inviting her students into what she calls maker composition or remix composition. And she has her first year composition students basically take this idea of remix and making and that you know, forms her whole course. And so she has them creating digital videos, uh, you know, digital stories, blogs, hypertext, all kinds of things like that. And I think it's a really great example of what we can imagine um, when we think about using digital tools in a, you know, where we would typically see freshman comp, let's learn how to write an essay. She's really pushing the boundaries. 
And then last but not least for teacher examples is my uh, good friend and colleague Aram Kabodian. He teaches in uh, East Lansing and he got the idea from, I think it was Humans of New York, he wanted to have his students emulate that process by creating a Humans of Greater Lansing uh, website. So he asked them to uh, develop their own stories, take their own pictures, and, and show the stories of others, again, using technology and infusing that maker ethos, but doing it in such a way that, again, really relied on that human connection. And it wasn't just about finding a picture in a story, it was about going out and taking that picture and talking with someone in order to create that story. So. We're going to shift here in just a minute and start thinking about some tools. I do want to be mindful, though. I can see the Twitter stream is um, going quite quite steadily over here. So, Laura or Chris, is there anything we should pause and elaborate on before we move into the last segment of our presentation? Um, I think you're getting tons of love. And, and I'll just say, um, for those of you that are keeping track of, of the awesome educators, um, on our Camp Stuff page, um, there's a link to Troy's wiki where he has links to all of these people and their incredible work. So if you're if you're at home trying to keep track of everyone um, from the slides, you can go straight to his uh, his wiki. Okay, great. Well, I will forge ahead with a couple tools, and then we'll definitely uh, hopefully have some time for Q and A as well. So let me jump into that and here we go so here's my challenge to you all I'm really been thinking about this and again Chris and Laura I appreciate this offer opportunity because you've helped me um, push my own thinking about what it means to be a digital writer and how we can infuse this maker ethos and so my guess is that many of you are familiar with some of these tools on uh, the left side Erasmus I just mentioned from Aaron easily as well as pictograph and infogram lots of tools for making infographics are out there we also have tools like Prezi and Glogster that have been around for a while s'more allows you to make online videos Weebly make websites we video is an online video editor now I know for some of you that, that entire list could still be new and, and I don't want to say don't use those. Um, certainly check them out, try them out, think about having your students use them. But I want to introduce you to the ones over on the other side of the, uh, where I'm saying, you know, here's the opportunity to, to step it up another level and think about what you can do with digital writing. We're going to look really quickly at play and then two of uh, Mozilla's tools, uh, Popcorn and X-Ray Goggles, and then also talk just a little bit more about GameStar Mechanic. So Play is a tool created by the Annenberg Innovation Lab. Erin Riley and her team out there um, are designing a number of really interesting and interactive sites. Um, what makes Play unique is that all these little widgets that you plug in are interactive and um, can pull from other sources on the web. So if you're familiar with Padlet or some of those tools where you can make like a cork board or something like that, consider this like the cork board, but it allows for updated and interactive content like Twitter feeds and links to YouTube videos and slideshows and things like that. So, you know, there are a few examples on the Play website of how teachers have constructed uh, different boards. Um, you know, around a particular topic or a particular piece of literature. And I just think this is a really interesting tool that you could not only create boards on play for your students, but invite them to create the boards as well and get them interacting. And so it, it's kind of taking this digital composition process to a new level because say they make a video and put it on YouTube, um, they could then embed that video in play. Or say they make a slide deck and share it on SlideShare, they could then put it on play as well. So I think the opportunities for inviting students not just to find other people's media, but to actually make their own media and then condense it into this one um, kind of central hub is really unique. This particular one I took a screenshot of I think is also interesting because it kind of goes off that same wonderopolis type of questioning like what do you wonder about well why is water so important and that's a pretty good uh, question to ask and certainly to answer and explore so what else uh, another tool 
is um, Mozilla has a suite of tools called WebMaker. And I'm only going to focus on two of the tools. The first one is called X-Ray Goggles. And what you can see from this particular um, little screenshot here is that, oh, I'm on CNN.com and I've got all the normal stories about the cops being fired or sheriff or Vladimir Putin, such and such. But what in the world is this? This is a screenshot of the Michigan Reading Association's uh, flyer for this year. What happened? Well, Google, or Google, pardon me, goggles, the goggles from WebMaker allow you to see inside a web page and basically change the underlying um, HTML code. You're not actually hacking the web page itself, so I didn't do anything bad to CNN here, but what I did do is I was able to change their headline and able to change their picture, and I could hack. Their, their original tool was called Hackasaurus, and I think that tool might still exist, but now the better page to get it is off of this um, X-Ray Goggles page. It allows you and your kids to play with the structure of the website. And I think this is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, because coding and website development, I think, are a new literacy that really need to be explored in English language arts. And number two, because we want them to be thinking critically and carefully. What is it that we could do to a website like CNN or any major media outlet or any corporation or organization? How can we help them think critically about who is sending the message and who should be receiving it? Um, one time I did this type of a, a project with some fifth graders. We, you know, quote unquote, hacked the McDonald's website and we, we talked about um, healthy food and how we could put healthy food and whether McDonald's version of healthy food was really healthy or not. And they were able to make up their own menus and put their own images in there of healthy food. So x-ray goggles are a really unique tool, all kinds of digital literacy opportunities and critical digital literacy opportunities as well. The other tool that um, uh, Mozilla makes is called Popcorn. Popcorn, um, as the name might imply, is related to the movies, and but it's also related to anything you put on the web. So you can see from this very, um, you know, quick screenshot here that you can take a number of different things. Here I've embedded a YouTube video and also a cover of the book to come back to Elise and the book we wrote because digital writing matters. And I have this, um, you know, image here and I'm superimposing it on the video. That's not actually in the original video, but using the popcorn maker, I can superimpose that. Also, for people who are familiar, um, at least, to, you know, this was part of my childhood and young adulthood, the pop-up videos from uh, VH1 or MTV or whatever, you can put little pop-up text, you can put captions, you can also embed maps, you can do all kinds of interesting things mixing media. And again, this comes back to the idea of remix and fair use. Our students, and, and us for that matter, we have a great deal of latitude in fair use rights. And we really want to think about how we can um, leverage those fair use rights. And Mozilla's Popcorn Maker is a really nice tool for, again, blending all kinds of media from across the web, especially if you want to think about it in a chronological format of listening to a story or viewing a video. The last piece of this puzzle I've already kind of hit on, but I'd like to talk about just a little bit more, is GameStar Mechanic. And GameStar Mechanic is a tool that um, provides some training for students. They go through, they learn a little bit about um, what it is that, uh, you know, goes into creating a video game. And then they can also begin thinking about the settings and the characters and the places and things like that. So again, the, what I want to point out here, this is just a snapshot of what you can do with some of the level settings. You see things like background, background style, music. So again, you know, when we talk to kids about crafting narratives, we're constantly talking to them about setting and tone and things like that. If we look at GameStar Mechanic, like Kevin does, um, it's a really interesting opportunity to get kids thinking, okay, I can do this in, in words, but how can I also do this in images and other forms of media? So it creates this really interesting synergistic conversation between, oh, okay, what is it that I want to um, get across here? How can I do this with my writing, but how can I do this with my digital writing as well? 
So with all of that, and we ha don't have nearly enough time to go into all of these sites too, but I just want to make a quick mention of some other places that I find inspiration that I think um, teachers will find inspiration for their really taking their digital writing to the next level. I already mentioned Gail's Digital ID Project, uh, the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub, those are the connected learning people. The Digital Youth Network is also connected to MacArthur's Digital Learning uh, Initiative, uh, and they have a number of great resources. Edutopia, I already mentioned. Uh, MacArthur, that's the main page where you can find out about all the different projects that have received funding from the MacArthur Foundation. And then Mozilla also has created what they call the Hive Learning Network, um, and there's one right in New York City, so you could check that out, as well as other places around the country. And then, of course, the National Writing Project continues to support this work in one of those places is on the Digital Is website where Laura has resources among many many other educators. So I want to close um, not quite where Laura started yesterday but close uh, with a quote from Ken Robinson and in his book Out of Our Minds Learning to Be Creative he talks about this idea about deliberation and intention and what it means to be creative. And I think this really speaks to the heart of being a writer and being a maker, and I hope to being a digital writer as well. Ken Robinson says, being creative involves doing something. It would be odd to describe as creative someone who never did anything. To call somebody creative suggests that they are actively producing something in a deliberate way. So again, between this balance of uh, creativity and play and excitement and fun, we want to give our, our students a chance to explore and to try some things out. We also want to give them the opportunity to fail and to learn from their failures. Um, but we also want to, like we always have with writers, focus on the writer first and then focus on the broader questions about the technology. If we give them the opportunity, we provide them the feedback, we scaffold them through the process, even if we're not quite sure of every button to push on every website, we're going to help our students become much better digital writers in the process. Even if we don't know everything that we're supposed to do, they'll help figure that part out. We want to focus on the message that they're trying to send. So with that, I'm going to pause and catch my breath here really quickly and see what other questions have come through on the Twitter stream and uh, hopefully have just a little time for Q&A. Yeah, so every, uh, thank you, Troy, and we'll say thanks again. But anyone, if you have questions for Troy, you have him now. Um, so please uh, tweet them to hashtag the Ed Collab Maker. Um, and all three of us are busy looking at our devices, and we'll pull some up. Um, Troy, one that I missed at some point, um, I can't remember, so I'm not going to say who said it, but um, if you could say your top two favorite tools, what would your top two favorite tools be? Oh, my. Well, <laughs> if, I ha if I have to vote for just two, I mean, I'm... I am not paid by Google, <laughs> but I, I will definitely say that the Google Apps for Education, uh, yes, I, I know people can criticize this and that about Google, but I think by and large, Google Docs and Google Apps are, are just an incredible resource. And then, uh, you know, right now, my favorite tool right now, this would be my, my second answer, would be Popcorn Maker. I, I've, I've known about the Popcorn tool from Mozilla for a couple of years, and I really started playing with it with some of my um, pre-service uh, pre and in-service teachers in a course I'm teaching this semester, and I'm just finding it fascinating what they're coming up with. So at the moment, it's Google Docs. Well, always, always it's been Google Docs, and at the moment, it's Popcorn. <laughs> Popcorn maker, and I, uh, I saw a few people. I myself, when you referenced uh, VH1 pop-up video, I was right there, right there with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I also like you. I, I know of Popcorn Maker. I've played with it a little bit, um, but but I think you're right. Like seeing it in people's hands and how students are really using it is amazing. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I've got a, a couple different. Um, people in this class that are thinking about how they're going to use popcorn and so for instance one of the young women who's going into teaching is is very interested in you know gender roles in society and so as particularly in sports because she's an athlete and she's going to find little video clips from like ESPN and different commercials and what's great about popcorn because it used you know you had to like go to YouTube <clears throat> 
figure out a way to download the video <laughs> and then like cut the videos. But now with popcorn, you can queue it up to any moment in a YouTube video and say, I only want this 10 seconds of the video to play. And it, it's just really interesting. And then you can segment all those things together from different sources. So, Awesome. Yeah. And um, how about a, a question from me? So uh, what's next for you? What's, what's something that you've been thinking about or, or maybe working on that we could get a heads up on? Yeah, so I really appreciate you asking that. So um, later this month, uh, Kristen Turner and I have a book coming out from NCTE called Connected Reading. And I see Frankie's on the Twitter chat. She and Bill Bass have a, a companion book coming out. And I, I don't quite know your title, Frankie, so you should shout it out in Twitter. But um, it, it, it's looking at the reading instruction for all students. And Frankie and Bill looked at it for elementary and middle school. And then Kristen and I looked at it from middle and high school. So Connected Reading is coming out. Um, and many of the teachers that I mentioned here in the presentation um, are part of a book uh, that we're producing for Teachers College Press um, about assessing students' digital writing. Oh, wow. uh, so that's coming out soon. And then um, Dawn and I, who I mentioned Dawn in the presentation, we have a book coming out from Corwin called Re Research Writing Rewired, which will hopefully be out by the fall. So believe it or not, I've been copy editing three books. Like do you months. sleep? When do you sleep? <laughs> not enough. Not right. enough. I know, I know you know that problem. <laughs> right, right. Well, um, I, I just want to thank you on behalf of the amazing love that you're getting through Twitter yes, um, thanks, for, for sharing with us this evening um, and for helping us think about, um, you know, Laura had mentioned a bit yesterday of, uh, you know, we can have hands-on maker spaces, but if you don't have access or the space for hands-on, you can move to the digital world to, to do some hands-on work there. And, and I think what you've shared with us this evening is, is the, the perfect way into that. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Troy, for being here with us. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, everyone on Twitter. I'll try to catch up and offer some responses later. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. And so um, everyone that's with us here, uh, thank you for coming out uh, this evening. Um, if you are a cadet or a maker, we'll be heading over to um, our sessions in just a few minutes. Um, so tonight, cadets and makers uh, will be thinking, we'll do a maker share together. Um, then we'll um, actually flip flip those bullets around. We're going to see um, uh, Rebecca and Liza from the Institute of Play will be sharing some work uh, that they're doing in the Quest to Learn schools and just in general in supporting play and gamification inside of uh, our classrooms. And then Laura and Steve will be presenting together about advanced making and we'll have some more uh, hands-on time as well there too. Um, so. Uh, Yep, you can register. So thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, joining us in our keynotes. Um, thanks for all the making and, and hands-on fun work that you've been doing together. Don't forget, you can uh, continue this conversation on Twitter using hashtag the ed, uh, the ed collab maker, um, or you can head over to our forum space on community dot the educator collaborative dot com and there's space there for you to connect and talk about the work that you're doing um, so thanks makers thanks educators thanks all of you for all you do for kids every day um, cadets and admirals I'll see you in just about 15 minutes all right take care everyone have a great night <laughs>